Good morning, church. There's the voice I'm always waiting for. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving Sunday. Um, individually and as a whole, we all have a lot to be thankful for. Amen. Amen. I know normally I'm standing right there, but I decided to move five feet over to the right today. Hopefully that's okay. Let's turn to John 8, verses 48 to 59. John 8, 48 to 59. So we'll be reading from this section, but I'll be referencing a couple verses from um, 31 through 47, so right before this. But we'll try to focus on 48 through 59. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So the section that we read just now is basically the escalation of all of what was happening in chapter 8. We see that Jesus is proclaiming his, his deity, Um, his divine status, while the Jews are questioning the legitimacy of this. And he repeatedly shares this theme of him and the Father being one. And if you know one, you know the other. And it sounds simple to us, um, because we were blessed to grow up in the faith, and we have heard this time and time again, and, um, you know, from a young age we were taught this. But let's not forget that even the disciples had a hard time understanding this as well. Um, If we go to... Just John 14, verses 8 and 10, I can read that really quick. Um, Philip is asking Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus says to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. So if we go back to the passage, we can see that they accuse Jesus of being a Samaritan and having a demon. And Jesus never tries to defend his case. He never tries to protect any kind of reputation. He points everything back to the Father, as we just read. Um, Verse 46, it says right before this, Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? So if any of us were to say this, if any of us were to say, which one of you convicts me of sin? At least ten hands would go up immediately, right? Because we live in a sinful world. But a sinless Savior should never have to have needed to defend his reputation because there never should have been a charge against him in the first place. Only those with eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand would actually seek the truth. Everybody who questioned and wrongly accused him and said he was guilty of this and that, they were seeking something else. If we go back a little bit further um, to verses 30 through 33, we'll start to see that some of them were believing him. It says, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. 
So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? So as many of us can probably see, Jesus is referring to being free in a spiritual sense, yet in the the feebleness and the, the frailty of their minds, they're thinking it's like a physical bondage. But even in that sense of physical bondage, they seem to have forgotten the slavery in Egypt. They forget the ever-increasing Roman government at that time. And then they hold on to the fact that they are offspring of Abraham. They believe that because they are in that bloodline and they are offspring of Abraham, that they have this connection to him and and they have this ticket into eternity and and into the kingdom. They believe that they are, in a sense, they have this spiritual entitlement just because they are offspring of Abraham. And so when I read that and I was thinking of this, this sense of entitlement and that, you know, we deserve this or that just because of, you know, who our parents were, who it was down in our lineage. I thought of um, a couple quotes from an NBA player that many of us probably know, Shaquille O'Neal. And he was talking on this podcast about his parenting philosophy and that he doesn't want to just give his kids money just because he's rich. He says, my kids are older now. They're kind of upset with me. Not really upset, but they don't understand. I tell them all the time, we're not rich, I'm rich. And then he goes on to say, you got to have a bachelor's or a master's degree, and then if you want me to invest in one of your companies, you're going to have to present it, bring it to me, and then I'll let you know. I'm not giving you nothing. Then he says, I don't care if you play basketball, I don't care about none of that. He said, listen, I got six kids, I would like... A doctor, somebody to own a hedge fund, a pharmacist, a lawyer, somebody that owns multiple businesses, someone to take over my business, but I tell them, I'm not going to hand it to you. you got to earn it. And I think that really matches our, you know, kind of the passage we're reading in a sense. Um, And one example I think of that I've referenced before from the Old Testament is Hezekiah and Manasseh. We know that Hezekiah was one of the most godly kings of that time. He did a lot of good work, and God truly delighted in what he did and who he was as a king. But then, what does his son do? He undoes all of that. He has these child sacrifices. He builds up idols, that, the same idols that his dad had just torn down. Um, but at the end of his life, fortunately, we see that he repents, and God has mercy on him, even though he had just provoked the Lord to anger. But the point being, he had a godly father in Hezekiah, but just because his father was this godly king doesn't mean that he was going to come out to be some amazing king. Each one of us are responsible for abiding in his word and working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So in verses 51 to 53, if we go back to that, um, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? And so when they bring up Abraham earlier on, we see him actually, we see Jesus address their claims about Abraham. And again, we're kind of jumping back again, but to verse 37. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I don't know about you, church, but when I read that, my word finds no place in you, I kind of got the chills because that's a that's a death sentence right there. If they keep going down that path, that's that's Jesus saying, I never knew you. My word never found its place in you. I never knew you. Yet they're so stuck in their ways, they're blinded by tradition, blinded by this spiritual entitlement, that they don't recognize truth standing right in front of them. They're stuck on tradition, and they can't see truth right in front of them. 
They can't see the way. They can't see the truth. They can't see the life standing right in front of them. And there's a familiar passage that I'm sure many of us know in Mark 7. It says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. That's Jesus saying that. But church, in the face of revelation, our hearts determine whether we, we react in disgust, as these Jews did, or whether we react in discernment to understand that the Savior is standing right in front of us. So how does Jesus reply in verse 54 onwards? He says, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. That same word that Jesus referenced earlier, saying, my word finds no place in you, but Jesus is saying, I keep his word. I do know him. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? And then here's that big moment of revelation. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was I am. And so we hear that and we're, we're moved because that is a huge moment of revelation. That's Christ's claim to deity. The same that we see in, in Exodus when God is saying that to Moses. But how do they react? They pick up stones to try to kill the Son of God for what they believe is blasphemy. And there's many things to take away from this, but... My main point I'm trying to drive home is just because we think we know the truth doesn't mean we are seeking the truth at times. And as third and fourth generation Pentecostals, Christians in general, I don't want to just single out Pentecostals, but Christians in general, it's easy to take our relationship with Christ for granted. Because we grew up going to church every week, we memorized verses, we, we sang songs, we fell into this cycle and I'm not saying it's something we shouldn't be thankful for, because it is a blessing. We should be grateful for what the previous generations have done for us, but if we're not careful and we let that dictate our walk, then we find ourselves following tradition and not seeking Christ. And I hope not to offend, but we just read about a group of people that were so blinded by beliefs that they couldn't see Christ right in front of them. Being the child of a president doesn't mean you automatically become a president. Being the child of a pastor doesn't automatically mean you become a pastor. Being the child of a follower of Christ doesn't automatically mean you become a follower of Christ. Being a follower of Christ makes you a follower of Christ. And that's hard to understand. We have to seek Christ for ourselves. We have to individually seek Christ in that secret place to experience a fullness of joy that only He can give. And I remember always hearing Jitu talk about how he found Christ and just many others, but and I would almost get jealous sometimes because, again, I grew up in the faith, and like many of us, we grew up in the faith, and we were taught all the stories of the Bible. We were part of all these memory verse con contests and everything, but it's not until, at least for me, it wasn't until later in my life that I truly found Christ. And it took much longer because I was stuck in tradition for so long. And tradition has its place, don't get me wrong, but... 
We can't put tradition over the truth. Worship team, you can go ahead and come up. Feels weird saying that. So there's three big statements um, and verses from Christ in this chapter that I want to just read out. So verse 31 and 32 first. So the Jews said who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then verse 47. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. And then verse 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And so as I close here, I just have some questions for us to, to ponder on and just to think about. The first question, are we abiding in his word and experiencing freedom that only Christ can offer? And that goes with verse 31 and 32. With verse 47 that we just read. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. Are we hearing the words of God? Are we hearing that still voice? And then my last question that goes with verse 51. Are we keeping that word with assurance that he has defeated death? So are we abiding in his word? And after abiding, are we hearing his word? after hearing the word are we keeping that word is it written on the tablet of our heart because again just like what we read here in the face of revelation our hearts determine whether we react in disgust like they reacted ready to stone the savior or whether we react in discernment to understand that he is right here in front of us so this is just a a call to all of us to realign ourselves with Christ, to abide in the vine, and to seek him for ourselves, not through someone else's message, because that's good, but we have to seek him for ourselves. Not through a worship set, because that has its place, but we have to seek him for ourselves. Not through someone else's testimony, but for ourselves, because we have to seek him for ourselves. And so for anyone who's listening, my prayer for this short message was just that we would be able to open our eyes to see him. Because once we do see him, our lives are truly changed. It, it goes from different stories in the Bible all of a sudden to, to revelations before us that go past what time can do. Stories that don't, st- that don't get affected by time because each one of these stories, they impact us in different ways. And this is Jesus. This is the living word of God. This is his spirit in this word. And so that is just my challenge. Just to, if you feel like you are in a dull place, if you feel like you are not hearing his voice, if you feel like you have trouble abiding in his word, comes down to getting on our knees surrendering our hearts to him and simply praying father open my eyes to see open my ears to hear open my heart to understand because many other people they sought after you and they couldn't see it but we know that we can taste and see that the Lord is good more than anything else this world has to offer Many, many other things of this world, it can, it can entice us and make us think that this is good enough and make us think that maybe we don't need the Bible for today. Maybe we don't need Christ, but those things pass and fade. They fade away until it's gone. But only Christ can say that he is yesterday, today, and forever. Only his word is eternal. May his name be glorified.